Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of Hive1.net, an experimental social discussion platform for truth seekers and activists. I'm the author of a book called Revolutionary Mindfulness. That's about meditation and activism. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, a meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. All right. How you doing, Doro? I'm doing great. Looking uh, looking forward to this uh, this show. We're going to cover a lot of ground, it sounds like. So I'm doing yeah. great. How are you doing, Matt? I'm good. I'm good. We uh, we got some snow here in uh, Port Townsend, Washington. Our every four years we get a little bit of snow. <laughs> yeah, I think we just missed the big one. We got just some freezing rain and a sheet of ice, but uh, I guess up north they got a lot of snow. So yeah, missed it. Uh, so cool. let's see. How are we using the sh- the call today? What are we uh, or the the show? What are we up to? Yeah. Well. Uh, you know, I think we just dive into it. Uh, uh, there was, let's see. So where to begin? Uh, I mean, I guess, you know, we, uh, for all our many listeners out there, Doro and I were guests on a podcast last <laughs> night, which will yeah. be apparently released in a couple weeks. It called, uh, the podcast was called everything imaginable. And, uh, it was a fun interview with Gary, the host of that podcast it really what, was what, and what a great discovery to discover his channel i think that's a a real gem for anybody with a with an open mind yeah yeah he uh you know i i went through and watched a bunch of his or listened to a bunch of his interviews watched some of his youtube and uh, he interviews people all over the map uh he's always doing interviews with different people with people that are into ufo alien studies um yeah, I've, he has witches, people into witchcraft and mystical things, uh, near-death experiencers. Um, so, yeah, he had a, a lot of experience. It was interesting just sort of like exploring ideas with him. Yeah, it was wonderful. I hope he invites us back. Yeah, yeah. Or we'll maybe we'll have to have him on a, as a guest here. Ah, there we go. Well, yeah, let's see. Fascinating. Yeah, what's new? Well, what's new? Well, um, a couple things. Uh there is a uh, a new um oh gosh what has happened did we talk about the Miami aliens incident last week I think we touched on it I don't know that we got into any big detail uh, okay well so just uh I'll, I'll summarize there was an incident in Miami at um this outdoor marketplace and there were like a hundred police cars there there's lots of video of that going around and there are apparently a bunch of people claiming that three aliens appeared and yeah. they saw them and ran away in terror and chaos ensued and the police confiscated cell phone videos. And anyways, this is floating around there. I made a little mini documentary uh, and put up on my YouTube channel, with had, which has three firsthand accounts that seem credible. Wow. What they saw. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. You know, they, they did show video and I kept looking and I couldn't see it. Yeah. Maybe you can point it out to me at some point. Yeah. There's not great video of anything no. other than, um, I mean, there's a couple things floating out there, but in this day and age, it's hard to, to know what to make of any video evidence, but well, that's um, true. We don't need to talk about the Miami thing a lot. I just wanted to mention that happened. Yeah. Um, another thing that happened there's a um a video uh that has been validated as uh, a valid military 
uh, recording from an infrared uh, camera of what they're calling the jellyfish UFO. Oh, I think I did hear about that. Yeah, and I don't know. I could, if you want, I could play it on the screen here. Um, sure. Even though our listeners won't see it, but they could always go to the YouTube the channel and see it's really easy to find you know Maybe the you uh, can share your screen is that yeah, possible that's, a, that's what i'm gonna do oh. here once i find the correct control yeah it was it looked like some weird kind of uh video okay you're gonna show it here yeah yeah jellyfish ufo clip it's not hard to find <laughs> um oh yeah see i mean it's on news nation it's, oh my goodness uh, it's everywhere yeah Okay, I know, I know, I know. This is a show about true crime and mystery, but tonight... I'm just going to skip ahead to it. ...by a journalist named Jeremy Corbell, yeah. who claims that it was that. buried by the intelligence community. Look at this. He what called this thing, uh, whatever craft it is... Here, I'll mute her so we can just look at the... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, I'll that see. She'll do a couple close-ups. Yeah, it looks like a... It looks like a robot to me. I was going to say, it looks like a transformer from yeah. the, the kids' cartoons way back when. Yeah, it looks wow. like a, to me, that just screams because it's very stiff and it has these dangling yeah. arms, it seems like. And it, it looks like a droid out of Star Wars. To it me, really this. does. And it's going over a military base and it's on infrared camera. So when it goes white and black, that indicates it's changing temperature. And huh. which actually made it hard for the camera to follow it because it locks on to a temperature reading and follows it and so that's but they also said uh it was not visible to the naked eye so it was only visible on infrared which is something that um you know i've that's uh, creepy. <laughs> yeah that that's something that i've heard before uh, who was it um well yeah a couple different uh there's been several stories over the years that the military um, that people have been able to see things, UFOs and different things using infrared, but not with the with their naked eye. Oh, wow. um, there's even a guy uh, that I mentioned before, Chris Lado, who's a big uh, UFO disclosure, former Navy pilot guy. And he says that uh, a company has figured out that there's a specific, very expensive digital camera that if you um, have them modify the sensors on it to pick up... Uh, more wavelength you can see way more ufos in the air oh my goodness yeah look at that that's pretty weird looking yeah i don't think so, i've seen one like that before yeah so this is um so this is floating around there there's a lot of talk about that's trending on twitter wow um there was a new I'll, i don't have to play the audio from it but there's this They've interviewed, this is a interview with a, this is a, I think a military guy. No, that's an associate, but there, but there is at least one Marine uh, that says he was in, I think it was Iraq when this was recorded and everyone on the base knew about it and thought it was, uh, you know, didn't have a good explanation for it. They didn't find it threatening. They didn't go on high alert for it, but they definitely were seeing it. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Some of them so call when, it the when was monster. this? Was this just yesterday or? Uh, this was the last couple of weeks. This has been floating yeah. around there. I didn't. I finally looked at it. Um, uh, yesterday, I took a good look at the video. Um, and I, there's a uh, there's a, a show, a new series, like a three episode video series that just came out. Um, on Tubi or UB, uh, something called like something revolution. Hmm. What's it called UFO revolution? Yeah. UFO revolution on Tubi. Um, yeah, it apparently really goes into a lot of this stuff and I haven't watched it yet, but it, you know, I think it has Jeremy Corbell and it, lots of clips from the congressional hearing. And I think it gives this topic a really good dive. And so I'm looking forward to, and I think the, it's possible the, the jellyfish UFO was first released in that. That might have been part of what part of that. So that that's kind of hitting the airways and getting people talking on Twitter. Is anybody saying what it is or what they think it is, or just that it's a UFO and that's it? Yeah, I um what it's doing. I, all, just... I haven't gone too deep, but they've I someone referenced in the video I watched yesterday 
a book that uh, from years ago that referenced a jellyfish UFO, and they're claiming it, it might be talking about the same one. Although this, to me, that doesn't look like a jellyfish. It looks like a robot. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, does it doesn't not look, look like a dangly, you know, yeah. tentacle thing. It's yeah, I agree. Yeah. And um, I'm just gonna like skim through <laughs> major stuff. So mm -hmm. the other thing that happened is to today, Friday. 112 um the congress uh some congress people were getting into a skiff a secure compartmentalized uh facility to get to talk to apparently the inspector general about david grush whistleblowers allegations in more detail and here we're not playing it but i'm just showing on that ufo podcast uh that congressman tim burchett is on there today uh and he he did this last time he went into a skiff and got to hear some info he went on this show and he just tells immediately gives some idea of what he heard and uh, usually he's disappointed and he's not really told anything but i'll check that out and find out if anything any revelations came out of that yeah yeah i wonder it's it's starting to feel like we've got all the information they're going to give us for now <laughs> doesn't it until something else happens or something else breaks through something goes through the legal system or what is it um Stephen Greer is pushing for a just a, a SWAT team to go in and get these you know mm -hmm. <laughs> these people crazy yeah well and this is this is the one I really this is what I actually wanted to talk about okay. uh this is a guy who has a podcast called Vetted, but he's doing a reaction video to the Y files. You know, this guy that talks to Oh, yes. Yes, he's funny. Yeah. yeah. So this is, I think, really interesting. Um, and I, I'll just, is there if I just play a little bit from it? Because he Absolutely. talks about, he talks about David Grush and his suspicion that David Grush is not a whistleblower. Um but that he's, you know, part of a, an intelligence um, effort for disclosure, a coordinated effort. So I'll just play what some of what he says here. Oh, okay. Hmm. Let's dive in. Because once shows exist, and I believe we have recovered craft, but I'm skeptical of anyone who's worked in intelligence. Because once you're in, you're never out. Whatever's being said about UFOs by people like Doty, Putoff, Elizondo, David Grush, I take all that with a grain of salt. These are not whistleblowers. These are people who spent most of their careers in intelligence. The things they say, they're allowed to say. They have permission. Uh, permission for who? Well, isn't that the big question? Pat Price, the psychic who started it all, comes off as the most credible of all the people I talked about today. He was a retired cop from a small town. He used his gift to solve crimes, to help people. And Pat was a patriot. The CIA asked for help and he provided it. Four months later, Pat was dead. In my research, I found something Pat Price said that bothered me. He said this, people have infiltrated all government in sensitive positions, not to control government, the processes or people, but rather to be in positions of power, to stop politically any activity that may produce a result that could cause discovery. Americans want information about UFOs released. Congress tried and couldn't do it. Presidents have tried and couldn't do it. So if our elected leaders aren't in charge, who is? During Stargate, it was discovered that anyone can learn remote viewing. Some people like Joe McMonagle and Pat Price are naturally gifted, but the rest of us, with practice and training, it's a skill we can all develop. But that would mean the end of all secrets. That can't be allowed to happen. Secrets are the source of their power, whoever they are. And that's why Stargate was shut down. Not because it failed, because it worked. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Wow. Yeah. So uh yeah, he's saying that Pat Price guy, I, I hadn't heard of him, but he said he was part of Project Stargate and he was a gifted remote viewer that the CIA apparently got to help them demonstrate his remote viewing ability. And then within four months he was dead. And he's implying possibly he was killed by the C maybe the CIA and the secret keepers because it he was too good at it and they they had you know they then uh, possibly 
trying to stop people from learning how to remote view because it's a complete threat to the continued oh secret goodness. keeping. Oh my goodness. What's, what do we do about that? <laughs> That's big. Well, I, the, I mean, it, there's a ton of people that claim to be able to remote view. They're on the oh, internet, yeah? like, you know, Elizabeth April and others. So it seems if they were killing people that could remote view, I think they must have stopped at some point. Uh, and that's that's kind of my theory. I, I was I was going to sleep last night thinking about this. And I think, you know, I think this whole UFO alien story has been evolving over the years. And I think. Um, I mean, I'm trying to I'm I'm going to make I've got this like a uh, picture uh it's almost like it's like a giant uh mind map of concepts and pictures and people and organizations and uh and locations on earth and i'm sort of like seeing how it all seems to fit together but i think one thing i you know i think the secret keepers they have killed people in the past sounds like they may have killed this guy price i think they killed bill cooper who's a big ufologist he was like, killed in the 80s I think there's a guy named Forrest Stahl who seemed to be part of Majestic 12 who died in extremely suspicious ways, JFK, RFK. But I think I think the killing stopped. My suspicion is that at some point, um, people that with a little bit more ethics got control of at least the part of the CIA that was willing to kill people to keep this secret. And I, I think... I think they got that under control at some point so that that's why Christopher Mellon, Lou Elizondo, David Grush and others are now able to come forward because they know they're not going to be killed. Cause I think they've, they've eliminated that capacity from the, um, at least the part of the CIA, the part of the U S government that was able to so easily kill Kennedy, both Kennedys. Um, you, you know, what I'm wondering is uh, I, I've been studying up on the, you know what's going on in in uh, space and the solar winds and the the Schumann residence, resonances of the Earth have been increasing, and this one channel that I like to watch his name is if I can figure it out well I'll, I'll put it in the link below if we if we get a chance um, but he's saying that everybody uh, all of their chakras you could say their energy portals of their energy system are being magnified because of the Earth's Schumann resonances and, and, and suggesting that more and more people are becoming telepathic, uh, can remote view, are receiving messages. And I'm wondering if the, uh, you know, if this is, is why people are coming for, they can't keep killing everybody if it's just more and more and more. Maybe that's what's happening. They can't hold it back. Yeah, I think the, um, yeah, I mean, I just get the sense that they're not killing people anymore. I think they've had to give up on that. There, But there still seems to be secret keepers. There still yeah. definitely seems to be a group not wanting this to happen. But I think they're down to financial um, and uh, social and, um, you know, sort of corporate uh, weaponry, but not actual violence so much. That's... That's the sense. Um, Are they starting to cut off funding for the for this arm of the this whole secret program? Well, they did not pass the full UAP Disclosure Act in the NDAA that, but there, I think there was still enough in there. It still does say in the act that passed that uh, if you have a secret UFO program that's not disclosed, you are not allowed any funding. So I think they did manage to say that. <laughs> that's um, tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, but there's other, so uh, let me see it. There's a couple of threads I wanted to uh, sort of throw together for you for how this, what seems to be going on. Oh, good. Um, I love when you connect the dots. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, he kind of did it in this, um, he does it if we, if you watch, uh, I'm definitely going to watch the rest of this Why Files video because he, he goes through the story of, uh, the one part of this um, this secret keeper group was called the Aver Aviary, 
uh, group each they had these code names that were birds like one was the owl one was the condor the falcon and so on and uh some of these players are still alive and still they're known now today um one of them is this guy hal Putoff, who apparently was the owl but he's but he makes the point that david grush um and christopher mellon lou elizondo these are all people that come out of the intelligence community they all are former CIA or intelligence agents. And so he says, we can't just trust that all these people are just these noble, free speaking whistleblowers. Yeah. And he implies that they are still working for a part of our government, but it might be a sort of a break off part of our government that has broken away from the secret keeper part of our government. At least this is the picture that I think is going on. I don't think the whole government is united. It seems like the CIA and the deep state, and the military industrial complex, Lockheed Martin, they are just fighting to keep all this hidden. And there's some group that wants at least limited disclosure. They want to tell the people of Earth that there is other, there's non-human intelligence and they are here and we have some relationship with them and we have to have some sort of understanding of this. And it seems Grush Elizondo uh, Christopher Mellon, um, uh, this Rear Admiral Galladay from the Navy, Ryan Graves, David uh, Fravor, Commander Fravor, Alex Dietrich, they're all military or intelligence. They seem that they're all sort of obeying this very carefully limited plan of disclosure. And they they all actually, and this is what I'm going to show on my little picture, is like there's certain topics, every single one of them will they all have the exact same message. They will they will not talk about any of the locations on Earth that the UFO community has suspicions. There's some seriously big stuff going on, like Antarctica, S four, under you know under oceans, um, inner Earth. You know they won't they won't really they won't touch on any of those type of topics. They won't talk about Bob Lazar. They won't talk about Element One Fifteen. They they won't give you know Bob Lazar any credibility. Um, and the, the most risque thing they do or that at least Grush did is mention the Vatican and mention the Catholic church having a connection back in 1933 and 1945 to handing over a UFO. So that is like the most, I think, risque thing they've done to really stir things up. It's like, all they're willing to say is there's something real and you're not being told the full truth. There's a, and they, they claim there's a crash retrieval reverse engineering program. The Vatican is involved. It's like, they don't want to say a word more than that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Get themselves in trouble. Yeah. You know, I think there are two camps of, of people who are kind of observing this and, and let me know what you think. I think there's the ones, you know, those who are thinking, okay, this is a very controlled disclosure, little by little, we're getting as, as much as we can. The other camp is that this is a controlled setup uh, leading up to this Bluebeam project. Um, so yeah, who knows which way this is going to, is this real? Is this not real? How do you mm -hmm. deal with the, the, uh, the anxiety of not knowing what's going on? Um, so you, Matt, you're you're kind of in the camp of it's a controlled disclosure, right? Well, I okay. name those guys, gals. I guess it's mostly guys. Uh, they're part of what I call the USA and the, the pro USA controlled disclosure group. They mm -hmm. want a, a limited amount of disclosure. They clearly are pro United States, and probably they're protecting the United States military's knowledge of alien technology and stuff, and they're seem to be obeying some controlled disclosure plan that the U.S. government and probably the Gang of Eight in Congress, maybe even the president, they're all a part of. So that's, But that's just one group. There's a bunch of people I put into a wild card group, like, like uh, Bob Lazar, uh, Stephen Greer, Linda Moulton Howe, Diane Pasolka, um, Gary Nolan, um, and, uh, what do you think the difference is? is? I mean, aside, aside from those people are not military, right? Oh, That's it's just the topics they'll talk. It, it just can put them okay. on a, you can just show 
they will talk about <laughs> these topics. They will speculate about Antarctica. They will talk about different types of alien species. They will speculate about technology. Um, and they'll they'll just they'll go into these fringe, um, less understood areas and uh, abductions. They will talk about abductions. The, uh -huh. All the military guys that are they will not touch the abduction topic. They won't give it any validity. Mm. Um, you know, and and the wild cards. I don't know if they're, you know, I don't know where they sit. And it, you can do the same thing with the media. There's certain media companies that are completely on the side of the secret keepers. There's certain ones that and uh that are just seem to be on the pro usa disclosure and they will just they'll just go along with what the these um, military former intelligence disclosure advocates once said and then there's total free form media that will just explore everything like linda moulton howe and some podcasts you know like ours yeah um, we'll just yeah. go anywhere so what do you um, think the actual um, end result of, of this could be? What, what are the possibilities? Yeah, uh, it's, it looks like it's building up to something. It's going to build up to some sort of climax <laughs> of all of this. It, it does feel like it's going to reach yeah. a, a tipping point somewhere, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah I think the House of Cards is going to come crashing down all at the same time that we achieve you know, full artificial intelligence and Tesla bots that can replace all human labor. The, you know, Bitcoin will be, you know, completely, um, you know, it, I mean, the, the entire world economies might have a, a weird experience, but we'll have cryptocurrency and Bitcoin as this at least one thing we can rely on as a hard asset that has a, a, a controlled, trustable supply um, did the did the recent vote on the the uh, EFT uh, Bitcoin make it make a difference in that uh, projection you just made, or is oh, it? Yeah, the, the ETF, um, oh, the Bitcoin ETF, ETF launched yeah. uh, like uh, two days ago, or maybe it was yesterday. It was the first day yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, which is a landmark. I mean, it's it's just it's just basically going to enable every um, person with a retirement account or investment account to uh you know be able to to take part in the um have a piece of their investment into bitcoin but but here's an interesting piece of it and this is um i wanted to loop this back to that group of people i mentioned yeah. okay so i'm starting to see how these people connect to major organizations and industries so remember that whole group i mentioned with um the the military guys christopher mellon uh, Lou Elizondo, Grush, and all them, that group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Christopher Mellon is connected to the Mellon banking dynasty. <laughs> and that is, a, you know, Mellon is, I mean, now that I hear that, like Mellon is a huge, uh, I've heard of that name, that corporation before. And that is a big banking dynasty. So wow. one of the most powerful, the former deputy secretary of defense, not only connected to the CIA, also connected to one of the biggest banking financial dynasties in the United States history. Wow. So that's a piece. <laughs> yeah. And yes, it, and, yes the mystery and then thickens. <laughs> and then there's, um, I mean, of course, the Vatican. Vatican is a wild card in this. Um, oh, man, and I have a Vatican thread. I'll just go straight to it since it's on my mind. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a little bit of a tangent, but it has a, a reason. So let's jump back in time to the time of Henry VIII. Okay. And Henry VIII, King of England, is sending a letter to the Vatican. And let's say that you're the Pope. All right, Pope Doro Kiley. <laughs> you're in charge of the whole Catholic Church. And the wow. Henry VIII sends you a letter that says, hey, Pope Doro, I want a divorce. I want to get remarried. I don't like my wife. I want to get divorced. Will you let me get divorced? And this is at that time, you know, you're leading a church that doesn't allow divorce, really. Right. 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 That's right. So what would your response be when when Henry VIII said this to you? Oh, <laughs> I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I don't know. I, I Yeah. Good question. Right. Well, let's say you say no at first, because that's really not in line with your beliefs and values. Yeah. Let's just, you know, and so you say no, you can't. And then Henry VIII says, I really want to get divorced and pressures you. 
Yeah. And then, you know, maybe you still want to say no. But then Henry VIII says, you know what? If you don't let me get divorced, I'm going to break England completely away from the Catholic Church. I'm going to form a new church, a Church of England. I'm going to make myself the head of that church just so I can get divorced. Would you still hold out and say, no, I'm not going to let you get divorced? Uh huh. (laughs) My, My point is, if the Pope had just said, fine, get divorced, the Pope could have kept the Catholic Church in its position of power over England and prevented the entire Protestant movement almost. I see, yeah. Mm, Interesting. And so, yeah, so the question is, maybe it wasn't just because he was a stubborn traditionalist. Maybe this goes back to one of the big threads in ufology, which is that there is non-human intelligence that has this incredible interest in how we breed as humans. And they care even more so about certain elite groups, which at that time was in royalty. And so maybe they did not want to let, they literally didn't wanted that Henry VIII to breed with the person they had stuck him with. And it was a real threat to them for him to, to switch because it created a different line. And they, yeah, I mean, I mean, because like it's such an it was such a foolish thing. It could have just let him get divorced. It was yeah, a, it like led to the whole destruction of their power base. That makes sense. I mean, I have heard you know over and over that the bloodlines are you know the most important thing to 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 the higher up you know ET influenced people. So yeah, and so sense. I'll just keep going with this thread, but you yeah. can just jump in anytime. So, but so. So again, it's interesting that um, the, so the Catholic Church, it's uh, uh, there. There was like never a Catholic president until Kennedy, right? And it's like, why? Why was why was there such hostility in our country to a Catholic president? And still, it's I think it's a hard thing to become a president. I think we've had a couple Catholic. I think Biden might be Catholic, but. Anyway, so that's like a weird thread. And then it connects back to this David Grush revealing the Pope was involved with the UFO. Disclosure. And, you know, after David Grush went on News Nation and said that the Catholic Church and the Pope in 1933 and 1945, they handed over a UFO to the president within a month, like within three weeks after that, Bill Clinton made a trip to the Vatican and met with the Pope in private. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. He met with the Pope in private at his residence and they said it was just for whatever. But I, I bet you the Pope was not happy that they were suddenly put on the map to have to talk about UFOs. And I just think Bill Clinton was a representative sent there to be like, hey, yeah, we have let this come out. We, you, and maybe to try to get the Pope on the side of the pro USA disclosure movement. And, and maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe they're connected to something. But anyway, so that's one thread. Yeah. So this and uh, the other thread that, you know, that this is a this secret is an ancient story. This is a, a long standing story in the group of secret keepers. A lot of people have said that the way the secret is kept through the ages is through genetic lines. You're in a family like a mafia family and it's right. passed down generationally to keep the secret. And so. Um, And also David Grush says the Department of Energy is uh, one of the ways they've hidden this because they've called everything about UFOs nuclear secrets. And so it's hidden in um, the Department of Energy as a nuclear secret is one way to hide it. And it's outside of the Pentagon and outside of um, oversight that way. Mm. So there's only been one article that's come out that's really attacked David Grush. um, And it was one that tried to make him sound non-credible because he had uh, some post uh, PTSD from yeah. experiences in Iraq and some of his buddies getting killed or one committing suicide. And that piece was written by a guy named uh, Ken Klippenstein and who's a, a sort of an obscure po- a blogger journalist, but Ken Klippenstein's dad works for the department of energy. It's just really good. <laughs> interesting connection there that it's like yeah. it shows this possible like family line as part of the protective thing and then 
the the final another thread that's well and the other thread is that lou elizondo there i've read in many places that he's a freemason like a high level freemason so that's one connection but that guy i mentioned hal put off um who's also part of the lou elizondo david grush christopher mellon sort of disclosure former cia group hal put off was a high-ranking scientologist mm, boy and so <laughs> it just and, gets more interesting yeah and so we got this like we, we have sort of it looks like on the secret keeper sides we've got the department of energy we've got lockheed martin um and uh these military groups and then we have on this apparently pro-usa disclosure side we have scientology we have the freemasons we have the christopher mellon uh finance banking uh you know uh groups so so maybe that's sort of how it's divided it maybe the finance world is now moved over the the to the side of a controlled disclosure and you still have this group over here with this military um you know this group that has this horrible past of murdering presidents and murdering people and stirring up wars to make themselves wealthy and they're just they, they don't want it to ever come out because they're just going to look so horrible but there's a group over here that's now maybe got control of the bulk of wealth maybe blackrock is actually on the side of the the usa controlled disclosure group okay now this is the final thread how it all comes together i was <laughs> just gonna ask where does that tie into okay go ahead yeah okay so the bitcoin <laughs> etf yeah has launched Okay, and it like it's an exchange that the SEC approved the Bitcoin exchange traded fund, uh, 11 of them actually approved 11 of them yesterday. And it was like, and so everyone that was interested in Bitcoin went into their retirement accounts and their trading accounts yesterday morning and they're like ready to buy the Bitcoin ETF. Yeah. And guess what? <laughs> Three of the major uh, brokers in the world, three of the big Vanguard, Merrill Lynch, and UBS, all refused to let their customers buy the Bitcoin ETFs. Oh, wow. Yeah. They, oh, wow. Black, so BlackRock let them, Fidelity, let, I mean, Fidelity and BlackRock, they both launched ETFs. So they, they were like, they were on board. So the financial world is now revealed itself to be totally split yes. on i mean but this is like i mean this is a really irrational split i mean it's a i mean van so all over twitter right now people are posting that they're transferring their entire retirement accounts from vanguard to fidelity i mean everyone is just like i mean these people that have been with vanguard and merrill lynch for decades and decades they have thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes people have a million dollars in their retirement account and they're just going over to fidelity and they're um they're transferring their entire accounts because vanguard is like no we don't bitcoin does not fit our philosophy and we don't you know believe it's too volatile to let our wow. users buy it's a tragic anything. mistake i think yeah oh it's well so it's it may not be a mistake it may be a weird strategic move because oh yeah because vanguard owns a bunch of shares of BlackRock. And so they're letting their customers leave to go to a competitor, which technically they may still own. And they're, oh, what Lord. it's really doing is just blocking ordinary people from getting in early on the Bitcoin ETF. And it's giving plenty of time for the rich and the people connected with BlackRock to be in institutions to get in while the price is still below 50,000. Oh, the games they play. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's crazy. And, but they are losing customers and their, and their, their reputation is getting crushed by it. And so it's like, I don't know how long they can last, but it's, it's also irrational because Vanguard, they allow people to buy micro strategy, which is a company that basically just buys tons of Bitcoin. And so they let you do that. They let you buy mining companies, Bitcoin mining companies, which is just another way to get exposure to Bitcoin. It was letting people buy the Grayscale um, Bitcoin Trust before this. Um, but now that the Grayscale Trust has converted to a Bitcoin ETF, it won't let them buy it anymore. It's 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 just a weird wow. 
it's a weird and so maybe the financial world i mean maybe this is the split in the financial world over bitcoin maybe this is in some way metaphorically connected to the part of the split over disclosure and the relationship with aliens i mean maybe the same group that is tied to i mean i'd like it to break down the way that you know it was my preference it would be the the anti bitcoin group would be the same group connected to anti disclosure the secret keepers who killed presidents who love wars who use you know the 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 ability to print money to fund their endless wars and um you know i prefer that the vanguard and them be on the side of the the horrible secret keepers but it, oh, it's man. weird to think that maybe blackrock is on the side of good yeah um, yeah it's yeah you know let's stretch the imagination a little real quick and and say what is the best case scenario that could come out of this hmm. i mean the best case is a smooth transition to a much better world yeah where um you know where people uh well what i mean there are people saying that really bitcoin if we if we were in a world where the dollar was as solid as bitcoin if we had been using something like bitcoin the last 10 years instead of the us dollar then you know people that had saved $100,000 over the last 10 years would have saved bitcoin over that time and that bitcoin instead of being worth $100,000 today would be worth like $600,000 yeah because the money would inflate and or deflate whichever yeah deflate and that it if if we shift to a world in which you're using sound money then it there's i mean they're saying the it, by using the US dollar we're basically like indentured servants because you're using inflating money so it makes you more i mean they use the word slave like mm -hmm. we're really in a, in a in like an economic slavery using these horrible currencies so maybe we can transition to a world where we're using money we can trust and we're using uh and we have decentralized media that is censorship proof and people can collaborate and share ideas and and of course the flipping non-human intelligence reveal themselves and they're enlightened and they're nice and they we get to explore the galaxy with them <laughs> and what do you think about the free energy issue yeah oh yeah well that's another thing they yeah. i mean and david grush says that there's there's energy technology being suppressed that is actually another major thing that he says and um so that's that's nice that that's part of the um the usa disclosure group are willing to say that because uh, you know stephen greer says is all over that and says yeah really, they have yeah. free entry the, you can have a little box that can power your car forever or your house or i, I think he may even go so far as a tiny little box can power like a power plant and, and it's not tied into any grid. It's just you set it up and, and you're independent, right? Isn't that it? You're not. Yeah, he says it, it, it. Yeah. Yeah. He says there's no pollution. But I think, right. you know, I would have, I would say just from like a scientific point of view, I've heard, I've heard some people suggest it's possible that that energy is coming from another dimension. And so there's, there's a chance that the free energy technology might pollute a dimension we're not in, but that, I mean, that, that, that's one thought that's crossed my mind. Maybe, um, maybe that's why the interdimensional beings don't want us to have it because it damages their dimension. I don't know. That's yeah, just, that's one of my theories. Yeah. That, is, that is, that's very interesting. You know, what, what is this energy? Is it the, is it chi? Is it conscious? I mean, who, yeah, you know, it, there's a lot of um, questions about energy to begin with. So if we all had free energy, um, boy, that would change the whole fabric of, of, of society everywhere. Yeah. And, and Gresh and them say it's the reason they don't want the energy, the free energy is because it would just destroy their, uh, the economy, their, their oil based, you, oh, know, yeah. In, yeah. Uh, you know, wealth, which is, it's just like, it's so hard to imagine that people are that selfish that they're just like no we have billions of dollars we make billions of dollars off of oil revenues we can't let the world have free energy because we can't turn off our money spigot like yeah yeah oh, really that's so i mean is it do you not have enough money 
that you I have wonder to... I wonder if they're concerned about how to set up you know how to switch over you know because we are so completely on one side of the track you know being dependent on and uh, fossil fuels and everything the the leap over to the other side of the track would be I don't know. I mean, it it would certainly be globally disruptive everywhere. And how do you make that transition? Oh, we'd figure it out. Wait, we replace a power plant with a box, you know? Okay. It, I mean, yeah. it's just like easy, easy problem to solve. Okay. I, All right. We'll put you in charge of that, Matt. <laughs> I mean, I really, I just think, I think Stephen Greer said this, excuse me. <laughs> That they just are, they're sitting on, you know, like a trillion dollars of oil infrastructure that will become worthless overnight. Right. And so they just don't want their, you know, billions and billions of dollars of oil rigs and oil drilling things and all this to be just become worthless overnight. But not only that, but I mean, think of all the people working. Those are real people who are running that entire system. You know, probably millions and millions of people running this whole industry would be out of a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, it's sort of it, it's my friend uh, Terry would always say, you know, the goal is the Star Trek universe where you have a because in the Star Trek universe, for the most part, there wasn't really money. There was, and uh, there was one episode where Captain Picard explained this to a uh, a guy that was uh, frozen in time and from the 20th century and woke up there. He was like, I want to check on my investments. I'm sure they've done well. And Captain <laughs> Picard is like, we, we don't use money anymore. And he's like, what do you mean? And Picard's like, we, you, everyone has whatever food and needs are met. And he's like, well, what do you do with your life if you don't try to earn money? And Picard says, you live your life to uh, enrich yourself and to explore and to learn. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I got to watch that one. Yeah, that's yeah. a good, maybe I'll, I'll figure out what episode that is. And, That'd and, be uh, fun. Yeah, yeah it's fun. it's the one where, you know, you can just, you can sort of just search the episode where the guy from the 20th century uh, wakes up <laughs> and talks to Picard. But the, <laughs> the other funny thing about the, the Star Trek universe is they, they're not consistent with that because if you watch Deep Space Nine, uh, the another a branch off you see on the fringes of the federation there's this space station called deep space nine and money is absolutely a big deal there they use gold plated latinum or something oh. uh, as a form of money and the the ferengi are all into it and trying to get oh. more of it and so even in the, you know they they couldn't quite keep a consistent uh, star trek universe that had absolutely no money uh they just couldn't figure out how to do it and that's kind of the way I, I don't see how we could not have, I could see basically a universal basic income that every person had, um, you know, a little bit of Bitcoin or something every day that they could use to make sure that they had uh, food and uh, shelter every yeah. day. And then, but it would only, you know, you wouldn't be able to get a mansion unless you earned more money or, you know, the, the nicest sports car or the nicest, whatever, you know, there's, always going to be some things are always more scarce and nicer than you others. know what would be uh fun for for everybody out there to watch it's an, a very old documentary called the zeitgeist um the zeitgeist movement and then another one the zeitgeist moving forward uh film director was peter joseph and it was based on an idea uh of of this whole concept of a moneyless cashless society what would that look like uh, and th these uh gosh i first watched them had to be 15 years ago maybe 10 years ago uh, no more than 10. um but yeah it sort of outlines this whole idea of what a cashless world would look like and i thought that was very interesting but i did have a few problems in my view but um uh, look it up it's a great one to watch it's it's a real uh It'll make it'll make you really think about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, if if the darn non-human intelligence, the Gala the Galactic Federation, if they really exist and they're enlightened and they have this utopian cashless society, they could just show it to us. Right. They could just show us how it works. Yeah. If they really have a society that doesn't have a hierarchy of any form. I mean, show me how that will work. I'd love yeah. to see it. You know. <laughs>
yeah i'm all, all for that yeah well would but you yes. like to close up with a few minutes of meditation or do you have yeah. some more threads to share um no, no, that was that was plenty now that I'm, was I'm a ready lot. For meditation. <laughs> You know, I look forward to these uh, these shows because you do bring a lot of information and it just makes it fascinating. Yeah, I well, appreciate I, I appreciate it. it. I'd go crazy if I couldn't, you know, debrief with you every week on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. So let's let's just spend a few minutes. Let's go with uh, maybe eight minutes, some, somewhere between five and ten, just to sure. just to get people calm, get centered. I know that you know, with this subject, a lot of people might feel, you know, anywhere from anxiety to to excitement, whatever it is, you know, it's it's stimulating. And so let's just lower that energy a little bit and come back to to ground uh, zero here to be right where we are feet on the ground. Hearing the sounds around us, let me ring a little bell here. We'll start with a couple of really deep breaths. And when you're taking in your breath, I want you to examine how your whole torso expands and then contracts, just releasing. We'll do that a couple more times. So the idea here is to begin to quiet the mind. And a lot of times it's really helpful to tune into the actual bodily senses. What do you feel? What do you hear? You could even open your eyes and just look around and say, what colors do I see? What shapes and shadows? Light, just examining what is. This is a very grounding practice. And scan your body looking for any tension. You might find tension in the shoulders or hands, facial muscles. So let's just watch this for a minute. Any sounds coming in, just watch them, how they arise and pass away. Things just show up out of nowhere into our sense field and then they dissipate and vanish. Sounds, shadows, sensations. Maybe there's some aromas coming from your environment. So when the world gets too crazy, this is always a sanctuary to come back to the breath. We can at least rely on the breath as something mostly relatively real, something to hold on to, a good friend. So wherever you are, let's just sit for one minute with feet on the ground or if you're sitting cross-legged, sensing the weight of your body being pulled to the earth. Feel how this earth supports you.
And when the mind wanders, which it does, it's the nature of it, the most important thing is to notice it, that your mind has wandered. And when you notice it, that's, that's the whole exercise right there, because that gives you the choice to continue on your thinking trajectory or to come back to your breath. Exercising that choice over and over again in the practice of meditation has a cumulative effect so that your willpower, your sense of determination becomes developed. Coming back to the breath, breathing in, breathing out. In this meditative state, you can sense the receptivity. You're just ready for picking up anything that comes in through the senses, but also through your intuitive mind. And when you're in a receptive, peaceful, open-hearted space, every once in a while, you can get an insight. Some people would call it a download or maybe a, a memory of some past understanding that you had forgotten. So these things can happen in this quiet, meditative place. Be open for that. You don't want to fabricate it or imagine it. It just happens sometimes. So this is a good practice to do throughout the day, even one minute at a time, we call them M&M's mindful moment. Just pause. Take a look around. Really acknowledge what you're seeing, what you're hearing, feeling, smelling, even tasting when you eat. This is a good time to just be in the moment. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora. Till next time. All righty. Take care.